I didn't think it was us that they were talking about. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, yeah, okay, we could let's let's lose the guys that go. Let's get rid of that. Let's get rid of that. Lot. What I didn't like was the great hate that those people pretended to have for the establishment of rock bands at that particular point. Anybody that played like you know something you know, a bit more compact or a bit you know, interesting that, that was all out of the window. On the one hand, I, I liked it because it was trashy news, but on the other hand, I didn't like it because it was a kind of return to infancy. Yeah, I mean, there's this permanent tension, isn't there, in, in rock music between the, the three chords and the truth merchants. You know, four, four and three chords. And the other people, like me, who say, well, what if we added a fourth chord and put it in five, four? There's always people like me messing up what these people think is pop music. Well, a few good bands came out of punk, but they were excellent writers and excellent musicians. But that wasn't really what punk was all about. Punk was all about not being musical, you know. And, of course, British Isles was the only country that fell for it, you know. They <laughs> didn't manage to do it anywhere else. One of the things that proper musicians objected to with punk was that they were always out of tune, the punk bands. Whereas to, if you listen to, Sch to Schoenberg and, and Cecil Taylor, there's no such thing as out of tune. It's just another bunch of notes. In fact, if you're going to play the same three rock and roll chords, instead of like learning all kind of fancy ones, why not just have to play the guitar out of tune? That'll give you something different. That's what I thought that was a kind of very lovely homemade solution to harmonic inventiveness. Just don't tune up, you know. Don't sing in tune. How far out can you get, you know? The notes between the notes. We're hitting them. The next generation had arrived, determined to overthrow Daddy in the archetypal Oedipal battle for supremacy. Only this time, Daddy was a prog rocker. You initially grow up with the music that the generation before you, your parents, have chosen, and you don't want it. My mum and dad used to listen to Pearl and Teddy Johnson. I don't want to listen to bloody Pearl and Teddy Johnson, so along comes the Who and bands like that. Yeah, absolutely, that's what I want. Oh, and it belongs to you. I mean, prog rock, to some extent, killed the pop bands. The pop bands killed the crooner. Punk killed prog rock. The landscape of 70s Britain bore no resemblance to the imagined mystical worlds of prog rock and Roger Dean. It was plagued by shortages, strikes and post-60s disillusionment. In 1979, an Iron Lady would be crowned queen in the court of the Crimson King. Lyrically, progressive music in the 70s was very divorced from social reality. Completely divorced and just not interested in it, really. But lyrics are always a problem in this kind of music, I think, because, because it is about music. It's about doing in interesting things with instruments, I think, and making interesting musical shapes and landscapes. But if you're going to have a singer, then what's he going to sing about? Uh, often the solution was to go down the Tolkien, Roger Dean route and to, you know, to sing about fantasy worlds and so on and, and that, you know, there's a kind of embarrassment about that now which I certainly share. Genesis missed the British punk revolution. Like many progressive bands, they were too busy being successful abroad. On their return, they not only weathered the punk front, now sitting firmly over the country, but perversely enjoyed an Indian summer. We were kind of unaware of punk, really, because we were up traveling, touring so much. We were not, we were not really aware of anything else that was going on. And, uh, and the, all we knew, that really, that the groups like sort of Yes and LP and everything had sort of disappeared a bit. So that left, in a sense, we were the last ones left standing. So we picked up everybody else's audience, is the way I look at it. But uh, I don't know. I mean, I think we, we always had that side to us which was based more on the songwriting perhaps than on the playing and that perhaps carried us through the 
started having hit singles. I mean, with Follow You, Follow Me opened a big door for us. It was the first time we'd been played on English radio, and it was a, you know, it was a reasonable hit. It wasn't massive. But after that, we were able to put out singles, and they would always get played for many years. Uh, however, you know, and then a lot of them did quite well. So suddenly that meant that the audience, potential audience, became much bigger. Most bands weren't so lucky. Procol Harum's tenth album, Something Magic, an ambitious concept in which their instruments played characters in a story that was narrated, not even sung, became their swan song. We finished it. I don't know how we managed to record this thing. And then we turn around and, and there it is, all of course, punks and, and... The way we left it up was just to sort of pack up on our last night of a tour in America, we said, that's it then. And we all went our separate ways. In the 1980s, original King Crimson lyricist Pete Sinfield uncovered a secret path into pop music as a writer of chart-topping hits. Try to write something that a lot of people are going to like very quickly and yet still trying to get something of you in it. Something nasty in your garden waiting until it will steal your heart, which for me is like a King Crimson line. So it's, I've just taken it into a different setting. King Crimson itself staged several comebacks. And its 1974 album, Red, would in time influence grunge guru Kurt Cobain. Somewhere in 1987, I probably gave up noisy rock. I mean, it was the old reunion tour. But in my mind, I was redefined as a jazz musician, which, which I probably should have been in the first place. Yes teamed up with hit 80s producer Trevor Horn, who helped tune their songs to the ears of a very different decade. But the expedition to the far reaches of pop music that left bass camp in the late 60s was by now lost, forgotten, or only spoken of in hushed tones. Frog had become a really dirty word, you know, it's a, a sort of thing that you didn't mention in public. It's almost the only kind of music where people will write off everything in, that's in the genre, uh, without embarrassment actually and just say, you know, it's all shit. You know, people would go to a record store and sort of say, oh, I'd like some, uh, uh, come to country and western, I'll be there some, uh, uh, you know, a bit of, uh, bit of new wage, a bit of modern romantic, please, as well. Uh, a couple of punk albums, a couple of that, that, thank you very much. A bit of classical, and, um... Can't you prog rock? But there were people out there that might not have liked Yes, but liked a bit of Genesis. Might not have liked the Floyd, but liked a bit of Jeff Hotel. Uh, yes, sir, hold up. I'd do it under the counter. I would do it under the counter in a brown paper bag and hold it round the side. You know, it was, it was, like, the, it was like the pawn of, uh, of the music industry. I went out and bought the first Sex Pistols album and didn't mind telling people that I, that I, that I had and that I listened to it. Whereas Johnny Rotten at the time would never admit to having listened to Jethro Tull. But many, many, many years later admitted that, um, that one of his sort of seminal influences was the Aqualung album. I met Rat Scabies 
in an airport, we're about to get on a plane, and he came up to me, and he said, I just want, to know, I want you to know I'm a big fan of yours. <laughs> but, you know, you just want to make sure that nobody was looking. <laughs> We were living a dream, you know, but it would be stupid for people to keep thinking that life was easy because you're living a dream. It's not, it's not easy. It's a lot of hard work and um, these lines on my face are, are evident. The, the lost chord. You're always looking for that thing that you haven't heard yet.